Today is our last day to talk about primes. And so what I want to do today is talk about a couple of things, ideally. Um, we'll see what we get to. There are a lot of very important issues that we haven't really touched on. But one thing that I do want to talk about, to some degree, is this doctrine of analogical predication. This is something that is key in understanding how it's possible for us to talk about God at all and how it's possible for us to reach any conclusions. So, let's start this way. You can draw a distinction between things that are unitable and things that are equal or ambiguous. So, you might say unitable just means unambiguous. So, give me an example of something that's utterly unambiguous has one distinct mean. So that's hard. Let's start with the other yeah. one. Equivocal. What's an example of something that's ambiguous? That's equivocal. That could easily be interpreted more. Oh, okay. Bachelor. 
That's something that seems unambiguous. Right? What is a bachelor? An unmarried man. Okay, and that seems pretty unambiguous. It's not like there are different ways of being a bachelor or different uh, meanings of that. Um, lots of sentences can be like that. He's wearing a tie. That's something that is unambiguous, right? I mean, I suppose tie is a little bit ambiguous. Um, wearing a railroad tie. But ordinarily, we understand what, if I say necktie, it's not really unambiguous. Now, here's what's significant from Aquinas' point of view. Those are the only alternatives. There is another alternative, and that is analog. So in the analogical case, we have something that is not ambiguous, but on the other hand, not exactly unambiguous either. There are terms he thinks that don't have two different meanings, but don't have just one meaning, have a cluster of related meanings. There's an example of this in Aristotle. Actually, Aristotle thinks B is like this, but he also thinks health is like this. A variety of other things are like this. So health is a good example, or let's say healthy. Yeah. Lots of different things are healthy. Give me an example of some things that are healthy. Yeah. Um, you could say, like, a salad is healthy, or you could say a person is healthy. One signifies, say, an action is healthy. Yeah. That's right. Good. So we can yeah. say, right, exactly. <coughs> Tom is healthy. We can say, a salad is healthy. We can say, working out is healthy. Good. And then we can I'll, also speak in terms of moral health. That's true. So we could mean healthy. That this is something a little bit about strong here. There are different kinds of health. But but for the moment, assume we mean physical health. But you're right, if there's something you know, about mental health and all that sort of thing, is that really analogical? Maybe it is. So we should think maybe, you know, in fact, maybe strong is a better example down here. There could be mental health, psychological health. Maybe those are the same thing. Um, what about uh, other kinds of health? Yeah. Um, like blood pressure health. Oh, okay, good. So yeah, low blood pressure is healthy. Think about the different ways in which these things are related to health. If I say Tom is healthy, what do I mean? Tom exhibits health, right? He actually is an instance of health. If I say a salad is healthy, what do I mean? It makes you healthy, right? Exactly, it produces health. What about working out is healthy? A similar kind of thing. What about low blood pressure being healthy? A sign of health. It's a sign of health, exactly. So here we have a sign. Here we have something that has caused. Here we have the actual having of the property. Um, so, in fact, this is cause that maybe back to the sign. Are there other sorts of things? There are probably other. Well, medicine, a certain kind of drug, might be considered healthy. And then it's because, not really that it causes health, healthy people don't take it, but if you're sick, it restores health. So restoring health might be another uh, sort of relation. In any case, Aristotle's idea is like this. Health is somewhere here. And then there are all sorts of different ways of being healthy. They all involve some relation to health, but there are different kinds of relation to health. Now, to say that the salad is healthy and that Tom is healthy, that's not exactly the same sense of being healthy. On the other hand, they're closely related senses. Okay, they derive from the same core meaning. And so, in fact, Aristotle is fond of saying there is a core or focal meaning to a lot of these things. And that, in this case, is just health. But then these all involve different relations to health. So, when he talks about analogical meanings, he's saying, look, there are things that are not said in exactly the same sense, not exactly said in different senses, said in closely related sentences, senses, they all relate to the same sort of focal meaning, the same core meaning, but they relate in different ways. Now, why are we talking about this? Because this is how he thinks our predications of God relate to the properties of God. So, 
I say, for example, God is just. Now, I can also say Tom is just. Are those used in the same sense or in different senses? Well, here's one of you. They're used in exactly the same sense. And then I can say, okay, I've got this idea of justice. I apply it to Tom. I apply, apply it to God in just the same way. Now, that means I really know a lot about God, right? I can talk a lot about God. I can use exactly the same terms and apply them to God. But that's a little bit scary because it suggests that somehow my finite mind is able to actually comprehend the properties of an infinite God. And that seems like a bold claim. After all, is God's justice the same as Tom's justice? We might worry that it's really not. Yeah? Could you just quantify justice? Like say that God's justice is infinitely just, while Tom is like somewhat just, maybe? Ah, okay, yes. Now we could think, yeah, God is perfectly just. Tom is just enough, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, that would be one way of doing it. So we could say, here's the idea. Really, we have perfect justice. And then we have degrees of justice that come out of that. And when we refer to a human being being just or something, we're talking about something down at this level. Human justice is something that, you know, is a lesser kind of justice. I think that's, that's very close to his position, I think. Why do I say it's not exactly his position? Well, this assumes that we can have some scale and that we know what infinite justice would mean. And so, really, with human justice would probably do, what would be more fair, we can ask? And we think we can perhaps at least, in some cases, answer that question. So, there is sort of a scale in our concept of justice. Can we then project that to the limit? Well, perhaps we can, um, and so have some idea of what perfect justice would be. And really, you might say, mm, we don't know if the limit exists. Sorry, say We don't know if the limit exists. We don't know if the limit exists, that's right. Now, his one version of the five ways says, yes, there's always a limit, and so we can be guaranteed that it exists. But that is one of the things we worry about, does that really exist? So we can think, yeah, what is perfect justice? And we even understand the term. Now, notice if we think, that we've really got a case of equivocation, that justice for God doesn't mean the same thing as justice for a human, then we can worry, well, then we don't know what it is, right? I mean, we only see one of these meanings. How do we know what we're saying when we say God is just? So he wants these not to be exactly the same, but nevertheless, not to be different senses either. So what he needs is for them to be related senses. And indeed, one way in which we can think about their relation is God has a perfect version of these properties the sort of infinite limit of those properties. Now, here's one way we might think of this. Then. Think about God and the various properties that we would attribute to God. So we can say, yes, God is just. What are some other properties we attribute to God? First, what else? So I'm thinking 
That's a triangle. And I've got this concept of triangularity in my mind that I'm activating when I think that. And, of course, for Platonic, we think there is a form of triangularity out here. That's the form, this is the constant. Now, <clears throat> this form, or property, we can say, is supposed to be in the object. But now, as soon as I draw the picture that way, you can say, well, I want to know about this relationship. In the case of triangularity, my concept of triangularity, you might say, captures triangularity exactly. Right? What is it to be a triangle? Yeah, to have to be you know, a plain object consisting of straight line, three straight lines uh, that meet, or we could say have that uh, a sort of object like that, uh, a figure like that that has three angles. Um, we can define it in several <coughs> different and equivalent ways. But that property is exactly what we're talking about, at least in geometry. Now, when I talk about things in the world being triangles. I don't necessarily mean it in exactly that sense, right? Uh, it's not quite the same thing. Things just have to approximate that abstract form of triangular. Well, I think, though, I have a perfectly accurate concept of triangularity. However, do I always have perfectly accurate concepts? Okay? Locke later talks about the adequacy of concepts. And he asked, well, is my concept really adequate to the property that I'm adding? Now, it might be, as in the case of triangularity or some other mathematical or scientific concepts. In fact, if you look through a dictionary for things that are not ambiguous, most of the things that have only one meaning listed are scientific terms, where they're introduced stipulatedly to have a very precise meaning. But if we think about it in this sort of way, we can say, well, all right, sometimes I have a concept that's adequate to a thing, but sometimes I really don't. And in fact, what about my concept of God? Is it adequate to God? Well, I think Aquinas wants to say no, it isn't. It's a finite approximation to what God truly is, to the real property that God has. And so, I have concepts of justice, for example, mercy, love, power, and so on. But are they adequate to the true property that God has? No. Now, one way of looking at the inadequacy is to say they're really finite and God is infinitely just. Um, that human justice is a limited concept. God has perfect justice. And so I think the scalar way of thinking about it is not, I, I don't mean to challenge that, I think that's often a good way of picturing the way in which our own concept of justice ends up being inadequate to what God really has. So, here's a distinction we can draw. We can say, yeah, in philosophy we have to talk about the extension of the term, and we mean the set of things that the term applies to, or the set of things having a certain property, or if we're thinking in terms of concepts, the set of things the concept applies to. Well, if we realize the property doesn't have to be perfectly represented by the concept, then we can realize actually the set of things my concept applies to, and the set of things that, the tr that really have the property might be different things. And I think that's what Aquinas is thinking about. He's thinking, my concept is only an approximation. It's a representation of this. It's an approximation. It's not exactly right. So what does he mean, really, by analogical predication? Well, partly, I think it's that our concepts are not fully adequate. My concept of God really doesn't fully capture what God is, and my concept of power, my concept of love, they don't really capture what power is, what love is, and so on. They're not fully adequate. So God has the actual property in each case that we're trying to describe, and then things in the world have it only analogically. Just as the salad and the medicine and low blood pressure and working out and Tom all have certain relations to health. They're all healthy but in somewhat different ways. So 
Basically, our concepts apply to God, but apply in different ways. Now, let's go back to the doctrine of divine simplicity. It says that God's justice just is God's mercy, just is God's love, God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, and so on. Now, a lot of philosophers have said that's a ridiculous doctrine. That can be right only if something can be just, for example, if and only if it's powerful, if and only if it's loving, if and only if it's personal. But that seems wrong. You could be just without being loving. You could be omnipotent. You could have power without being personal. And so they've said, obviously these properties are not the same, so it's ridiculous to say God's having one property is the same as God's having another. But from this point of view, it's not ridiculous at all, because really there is one property at stake, and what we have are different representations of it. So the thought is really, well, justice, mercy, loving, omnipotent, omniscience, so all of these are concepts that we have, but they really are act inadequate representations of one single property. Okay? Um, now, being self-subsistent, being existent, all of these things are also properties of God, but, well, in the end, they're really one property of God. Nevertheless, we have different concepts on them. And so our concepts differ, but the reality of God is actually a lot different than all of these cases. The properties, or God's having the properties. By the way, there are two versions, really, of the doctrine of divine simplicity. One is just that power, knowledge, love, mercy, justice, and so on are all the same uh, property. The other is that God's justice is God's mercy, is God's loving, is God's omnipotence, and so on. So it's really God's possession in all cases that are the same. Um, you'll find some philosophers say one, sometimes the other, sometimes they don't really quite see the distinction go back and forth. But in any case, we could say what's really different here are our own concepts. So just as we have many different senses of health, well, not really senses of healthiness, different precise ways in which we can describe something as healthy because they involve different relations to health, so there might be different concepts we have that all apply to God, but the core really here is God having one property, the God property, we could say, whatever that is, and then omnip not omnipotence, omniscience, love, mercy, justice are all inadequate representations of that. Now, the concept of God then is pretty special. It's something of which we cannot have a perfectly adequate representation. Our concepts are always inadequate. And in fact, we could then characterize a general point about this. We can go back and say, well, now we're in a position to say, there are certain kinds of, I don't want to say the concepts we have, maybe, but certain kinds of things that are really beyond our power to fully capture conception. So we could say some things are really transcendent. What does that mean? Well, it really means that um, no concept of ours is fully accurate. We have, at best, analogs. So, one property like this is God. Uh, God seems to be transcendent in this way. All of our ideas of God are, in fact, inadequate representations of God. Nevertheless, they are really representations of God. Now, by the way, once you start thinking about this, you realize, actually, there's this kind of thing that takes place all the time. Representation or approximation, these are things that we do all the time. Is my concept of this table adequate to the table? Well, not really. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of richness in my perception of the table, for example, but it's not there in my concept. And then there's all sorts of richness in the table itself that's not there in my perception of it. And so you might say, actually, this is a very familiar sort of relationship. It's not a bizarre one in any way. We might think that I have a concept, and then I have a percept, the actual seeing of a thing or whatever. And then there's the thing itself. And you might think, actually, it's just the same sort of relationship. My concept of this thing is never actually added to my perception of it. Here is an object. This Volume 4 of the Oxford Studies in the Philosophy of Religion. 
and here's the object, and when I perceive it, am I perceiving everything about it? No, I mean, my perception is a sort of representation of it. Uh, there are all sorts of things I'm not perceiving right now. For example, you're perceiving the front, not the back. I'm perceiving the back and not the front. Neither of us is perceiving what's inside until I open it up. Uh, and so you might say my concept of the thing, or rather my perception of the thing, is really not fully capturing the thing. But likewise, if I simply have a concept of volume four of the Oxford Studies and philosophy of religion, that's not fully capturing what's here in my person. The concept is far poorer than what's actually there being perceived. And so it's like that with respect to these transcendent concepts. Now, so God is one of them. What are some other things that might be described as transcendent? The good. Ah, excellent. The good. So good is another of these transcendent concepts. Now, what does that mean? That actually has very important implications for what we would say about ethics, because it means all of our concepts of goodness are, in fact, just approximations of the true good. So it implies that we're going to have different concepts, basically, of good. And they're all rough approximations of what is really one underlying idea. So what are some approximations? Well, you might think that ethical theories that we have are like this. So, for example, one is a sort of utilitarian theory, which means basically having good consequences, or specifically, let's say, producing pleasure. One of these might be you know, avoiding pain. <laughs> Those are both consequentialist ideas. One might be respecting people's dignity. One might involve virtue. One might involve obeying the dictates of conscience. And all of those are different ideas of the same one thing, moral goodness. And so you might think, yes, goodness is something itself that is transcendent, that we can at best approximate. And we have various different kinds of approximations of it. And they're all fine in, in a sense, just in the way that you know, seeing the front of this and seeing the back and seeing the inside are all fine. It's not like any one of them is bad. <laughs> so you don't know what to say the mistakes. The mistake isn't thinking that this is a completely accurate capture of the good. And so Aquinas is going to have a view of goodness and of the law and of morality in general that's going to say, well, look, uh, we we'll have certain precepts. Uh, and in fact, he takes one as fundamental. Really, I guess it's two. Uh, seek the good and avoid evil. But then what's the good? What's evil? Well, there are different things to be said about it. It won't be completely capturable in a set of rules. It will lie beyond anything because it's really something that has, if you want to think of it this way, many facets. But it's really one thing. It's just the best we can do is go up with approximations to it. What are some other things that might be transcendent? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Um, beauty. The beautiful, right? That's something that also might be like this. That's really a transcendent concept. We can have various concepts of beauty, but in fact, those are just approximations to what the beautiful really is. The beautiful is something itself that can't be defined. And in fact, that's another way of thinking about this. We can't really give a clear definition. Can we really define God? Not well. Can we really define the good? No. We can come up with approximations. We can't really give a fully accurate definition. The same thing is true of the beauty. We might characterize beauty in a variety of ways. They might all be good approximations, good representations of beauty. That doesn't mean they fully capture beauty. And you mentioned truth. Truth might be another one of those. Truth is a transcendent concept, I think, for Aquinas. It's something that lies beyond our ability to fully capture it, fully comprehend it. Uh, some philosophers thought, well, wait, it's very easy to capture the concept of truth. The snow is white, it's true, but can only snow is white. And that seems great when snow is white. <laughs> it's not so great when you get to something paradoxical, like this sentence is false, it's true, if and only if this sentence is false. All of a sudden we get, wait, that sentence is true, if and only if it's false, it all breaks down. And so that's, from Aquinas' point of view, one indication that the concept of truth is like this too. It really can't be given any simple definition. There are different representations we have of truth, maybe mathematical truth, um, uh, you know, physical truth or uh, scientific truth, um, sort of internal reflection. All of these are different ways of thinking about truth, different ways of representing truth. None of them fully 
actually captures the concept of truth. I think he thinks existence is like this too. In fact, existence and God have an especially close relationship here. He's not going to simply be God. And so if the concept of God is going to be transcendent in this way, of course, the concept of existence will be too. We can't really define what it is to exist. Um, and that's another indication that it's something we can best across to in different sorts of ways. Yeah, so what guarantees, <coughs> if we're talking to another person, what guarantees that we're talking about the same thing? Good, I'm talking to someone else. What guarantees that I'm talking about the same thing? Well, here's, yeah, this is tricky. The real constant, uh, yeah, let me start over. The real property is something here that lies above any particular concept that we have. You and I are approximating it. But what are we doing? When I'm coming up with a concept of triangularity, I'm looking at triangles, let's say, and then I'm abstracting something from them. Uh, when I am thinking about love, I'm doing the same thing, right? I might be seeing loving relationships among humans, among humans and animals, among animals, and so on, and then I generalize. So I am coming up with and remember, he's an Aristotelian, so it's from examples in the world that I'm generating my concept. And you're doing the same thing. Now, in thinking about what the property really is, we don't have a fully adequate characterization here. We've got something that is coming from below, whereas these transcendent concepts are things God has above us, and we're at best approximating. Now, why should I think that my concept is like yours? Well, partly because it's generated in the same sort of way. You and I have a concept of love that's being generated by the same kinds of relationships among animals, basically. Uh, what about our concepts of power? Well, it's something similar. Now, that's not to say your concept of power and mine are exactly the same, but nevertheless, they're being generated in similar ways from similar kinds of things in the world. So they're roughly similar. Um, and indeed, we can try to sort out <clears throat> ways in which they're similar. But as these sorts of things indicate, it, we might find out they're different. All of these utilitarian or Kantian or Aristotelian or intuitionist conceptions of, of goodness, for example, are things that do arise from similar things, and yet from similar experiences in the world, from similar observations, and yet people come up with different concepts of goodness, of rightness, and so on. And so it might be that we don't have exactly the same representation. Uh, and that will be another sign, actually, of something being one of these transcendent concepts. People will disagree about its definition. So you can have you know, different philosophical views of existence, of being, of beauty, of truth, of goodness, of God. But notice that's not true of lots of things. In the philosophy department, we teach <coughs> courses on aesthetics, and on ethics, and on philosophy of religion, and on metaphysics, uh, and also on epistemology. So knowledge is another one of these. But do we, do we teach concept, or courses on chalk? No, right? Why? Because chalk is not a transcendent concept. We think we can characterize it pretty accurately. And so it's not like, well, there are many different theories of chalk. What is it to be chalk? Um, well, you know, Aristotle and so the chalk people. <laughs> There's nothing like that, right? Why? Because we just define it. But it's, it's you know. That's right. To some extent, we delegate it to, you know, lesser and lesser. <laughs> Sorry, that's the old medieval concept of philosophy as the queen of the sciences. Now, I mean, the, in the 20th century, people have the idea that philosophy was more like the janitor of the sciences cleaning up the mess that they left behind uh, on the floor of the lab. Um, now it seems to me we have a sort of concept of philosophy that's somewhere in between. It's kind of interacting with the sciences, generalizing beyond the sciences, but not being in a, in a queen-like position in the orders, but not being relegated to the role of janitor to sweeping up the mess either. So maybe that's a healthier concept. Um, or maybe it's just a more pretentious one. We think we're just like scientists who are doing slightly, things slightly different. But in any case, yeah, sometimes it's like, oh, this isn't transcendent. We can come up with adequate concepts of this. What is salt? The scientists can tell us what salt is. And we can investigate what saltiness is. What the, you know, we can say, oh, we can replace that sodium chloride with potassium chloride. It still tastes salty. And so we can talk about all that in scientific terms. We do philosophy when we get to these transcendent concepts because basically people do disagree, and that's a sign that what we call our best approximate representations. So part of the reason I wanted to talk about this is that certain kinds of issues, 
that motivate a lot of modern philosophers are just not going to be of much interest to Aquinas. For example, in ethics, whether we should be consequentialists or Kantians or Aristotelians or intuitionists, from, er from Aquinas' point of view, it's going to look like the wrong kind of question to ask. Right? All of those are approximations of what we're after. It's just that none of them can be fully accurate approximations. And so I think of apologies, he has the most sympathy with virtue ethics, and yet he's going to favor the law. He's going to think of God as laying out eternal laws, and they will establish natural laws for things in this world because they will be directed at certain kinds of ends and governed by certain eternal laws. And so the divine law will actually end up generating laws for things in this world. And yet, he says, those laws are typically going to have exceptions. They're not going to be a perfectly adequate characterization of things. Uh, here's one of his examples. There may be a perfectly good human law that the gates to the city must be closed at the sunset to protect the city. But now, he says, imagine the following scenario. The army has been sent out against some marauding marau marau bands um, to try to restore order. And now it's losing. Basically, these marauding bands are attacking the army. The army is retreating, trying to get back into the city. They don't make it by sunset. You're the guy who is the gatekeeper. Your own army is rushing back to try to get protection within the city. Do you leave the gates open for them, or do you close the gates and leave your own army outside to be destroyed by these marauding bands? The answer is you violate the law. You open the gates, even though it's after sunset, because there are going to be exceptions. And I think he thinks that's going to be true no matter how we view things. Even at the level of virtue, which is the most accepting of these exceptions, nevertheless, there are going to be times when we say, yeah, in general, that's the right thing to do. But in this case, no, actually, there's a higher good to be served. And that higher good indicates that really um, none of these can be a fully adequate characterization of what's at stake. OK, well, gee, usually this takes me a very long time. But today, I've gone fast. Yesterday, I was filming these videos for my MOOC for the first time. And part of the theme of that is to go fast. So the first one was 21 minutes, the next one was 16 minutes, the next one was 12 minutes. And so pretty soon, I'm, by the end of the course, I'm going to just be coming in and saying, this is all the 20th century though. So like, the 1990s. Hey, Clinton. <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, yeah. <clears throat> So I'm a little feeling like that. It's like, wow, so it breaks through all of this. Maybe this is unintelligible. Um, but, yeah. Is there anything else I wanted to add? Well, yeah, okay, I'll come to the last thing. The doctrine of analogical predication that Aquinas lays out, and on which I think he bases his way of thinking that we do have some knowledge of God, but it's only analogical. Um, is a kind of halfway point between a doctrine that says we can know God fully and a sort of point that says we can't really know God at all except maybe negative. A lot of mystics have held to what is called the via negative, the negative way. God is not fully this, not fully that. We can only know what God is not. We can't truly really know what God is. And why is it saying, no, 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 we can say something about what God is, but we have to recognize that we're approximating God's nature. We're not fully capturing it. Um, now, there has been one major objection to this. Uh, which is why this the view is actually held in low repute right now. Which is that, well, in order for two things to be analogous, they have to share a property. And so, actually, there has to be some property that you can predicate unitive of God and creatures. Um, for example, there must be, I don't know if it's justice or what, but there must be something you can say in order to say, well, God is similar enough for there to be an analogy. Um, you can think this is a little bit obscure. Look, God is just in something like the way a perfect human judge would be just. Well, okay, you're saying in something like the way, well, what's the relationship between these ways? Um, if the answer is, well, I don't know, <laughs> that doesn't seem like much of a theory. Now, actually, his suggestion gives you something more concrete to say, well, look, it's a limit of that, it's a perfection of that. And so I don't think we have to just say, oh, I don't know how they relate. We can perhaps say something about how they relate. It's just that being finite beings, we don't exactly know how to describe this infinite limit except as the infinite limit of this kind of idea. Um, but there's something else. If we have representations, then is there some property that the concept and the percept and the thing all out that actually have? Well, no. One of these is a conceptual ability. One of these is actually something like a, a sensation 
One of them is an actual bank. They don't have to share a property. It's just that they have structures that relate to each other in certain ways. And so similarly, with respect to health, the salads and exercise routines and Tom and pediatric door medicine and what was the other thing I've erased? Um, oh, low blood pressure. Do those all have some similar property? Well, no, they all relate to health. Maybe they have the property relating to health in some way. But uh, we don't actually have to have characterizable here any sort of relationship that these have any property that they share, I think. So that's one thing I want to say. There's one other thing. It's actually possible to prove, if you think, if you think of things in the right sort of way, and you think, okay, we've got representations here or something like approximations, then you can actually prove that every transcendent concept like this does have at least one representation, does have at least one approximation. And so that's a nice way of responding to the mystic who says, I can't possibly describe God. You can actually say, well, if you can do it analogically or representationally or approximately in the sort of way that Aquinas is talking about when he talks about analogical predication, then you can actually prove that there's always an analog. And so you never have some of these transcendent concepts that we don't even have any finite approximation for. You can say there's always finite approximation for this. In fact, there's always more than one finite approximation you can have for it. So you might not have one, but it's possible to have one. There are finite approximations. So all of these things you might describe as analogs of the thing you're really trying to capture. And it's possible to prove logically that there actually are such analogs. And so there are always available representations you can use. OK, well, I didn't talk about faith today at all. Um, but we will get to faith soon enough. Um, pretty soon we'll be talking about Calvin and Faith, uh, the nature of faith become crucial. So we'll really start that discussion when we get to Calvin by talking about what Aquinas says about faith. So if you've read that for today, don't feel disappointed. We're going to use that very soon. But anyway, um, if there are no other questions, then I will see you next Monday.